Greetings! I hope that you are watching these videos in the order presented on the Week 2 Instructions page. If not, I recommend that you stop right now and view the video titled How Do You Correctly Number the Centuries in History from History Skills that is listed first in the video queue. Take a moment and copy the timeline you see here, pausing the video. Now that you've copied the timeline, place the dates below correctly. CE is the same as AD, and BCE is the same as BC. Note, you might want to place these numbers in, on the timeline in pencil or erasable ink. Again, pause the video until you are done. Let's check our work. You can see here where I've placed the numbers on my timeline. That first date of 2300 BCE is the approximate date of the Gilgamesh text in the Norton Anthology. See how it goes between 3000 BCE and 2000 BCE in the timeline? That's because, just like a number line in math class, the BCE dates are acting like negative numbers. The only difference is that there is no year zero. Also, take note of how the centuries would be counted and the millennia. 2300 BCE is in the third millennium and is the start of the 23rd century BCE. That's because, as the History Skills video taught us, the first year of a century labeled before 1 CE gives the century its name. So if you were looking at 500 BCE, that would be the beginning of the 5th century BCE. In CE, or AD, the reverse is true. The last year of the century gives the century its name. So for instance, right now we are in the 21st century, which will end in the year 2100. You see on this timeline how CE 400 is the last year of the 4th century CE, and it is in the 1st millennium CE. These BCE dates can be confusing. Please refer back to the History Skills video if you get confused at any time. We'll be in the BCE half of this timeline for the first few weeks of class, so the dates may continue to confuse you. There's no shame in going back to review it. Now that we've discussed how centuries are numbered, some background on the history of ancient Mesopotamia, and some generic features of epics, I'd like to talk for a bit about the culture of this region, its art, and features of Gilgamesh in particular. The first civilization in Mesopotamia, the land between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what is now modern-day Iraq and parts of Syria and Turkey, was the Sumerian culture. The Sumerians lived in southern Mesopotamia, and they kept a king list of their own rulers plus those of their neighbors. If you're interested in reading an English translation, I put a link for one in the resources section at the end of the lecture notes, which you can access on Canvas. The earliest kings described in the king list are obviously semi-mythical. For instance, the king list opens thus. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridug. In Eridug, Alulim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Alaljar ruled for 36,000 years. That's a long time. Our hero for this week's reading, Gilgamesh, appears in the Sumerian king list, but he's called Bilgames, B-I-L-G-A-M-E-S, in the king list, and is listed as a king of Uruk which you can see on this map in the southern portion I've highlighted there in yellow, Gilgamesh's city-state. He only reigns for a mere 136 years. So obviously, the kings in Sumeria are not what they were, once were. Despite the semi-mythical nature of the king list, it does give us some very, very early history of this region of the world, and Gilgamesh of the epic was most likely based on a real person. In addition to the writing and taxes mentioned in John Green's Crash Course History video, the Sumerians came up with numerous human innovations. They were the first brewers of beer. They divided circles into 360 degrees, the foot into 12 inches, and developed the 60-second minute and the 60-minute hour. If it seemed like they liked the number 60, you're on to something. Their numerical system was based not on 10 like ours is, but you guessed it, on the number 60. Although they were busy inventing so many interesting things still with us today, 
the Sumerian city-states were often at war with each other, which made the region vulnerable to attack by invaders like the Elamites and the Gudeans and the Akkadians. From their statuary, like this head of the god Abu, from Tel Asmar, located about 50 miles northeast of modern-day Baghdad, we can determine a few things about their religious views. See how the god's eyes are disproportionately large? This may symbolize the all-seeing vigilance of the gods. They are certainly able to see Gilgamesh's doings, as you'll see in this epic. Other Sumerian art, like this, the famous standard of Ur, was simplified to depict objects and people in the world by a few important traits. The standard of Ur has two sides, a peaceful side and a warlike side. You're looking at the warlike side here. If you happen to be taking an art history class, you might want to know that this technique is called schematization, but this term won't show up in any literature test, I promise. See how the figures are spaced with little overlapping of bodies and that poses are repeated? This suggests large numbers. The alignment of the horses and the positioning of their legs and the bottom register indicates movement. See how they seem to be speeding up from a walk to a gallop? You can see the human pictures, sorry, the human figures are technically in profile, but their torsos and eyes are in front view. This is a common feature of ancient Near Eastern art. Think about hieroglyphic figures. If you want a more detailed background on this piece, see the Smart History video link in the resources section. The Akkadian civilization, which had been centered just to the north of Sumer, took over from the Sumerians around 2300 BCE. That would be the third millennium. And this is when the version of Gilgamesh that we read in the Norton Anthology was written down in Akkadian. The Akkadian civilization assimilated some aspects of the earlier Sumerian civilization, like Gilgamesh, but it also emphasized loyalty to a leader instead of to a particular city-state. As you read Gilgamesh, think about the implications this loyalty to one leader has in the epic. You see Sargon on this slide. He was the great Akkadian ruler and leader of the first ancient Mesopotamian empire. In the sculpture, you can see both formalized elements like his stylized hair and beard, along with more naturalistic elements like his facial expression. As you read the epic of Gilgamesh, pay attention to what literary elements may be stylized and which show a more natural depiction of human nature. That's enough ancient Mesopotamian history. You can get the rest from the crash course and from the intro section in the Norton Anthology. I'd like to now talk a little more in depth about Gilgamesh as a piece of literature. Gilgamesh is a conglomeration of pre-existing stories and characters. The Norton intro explains how the version you will read came about, so I'll leave the textual analysis bit there. As the first epic, Gilgamesh displays many of the generic features I discussed in the epics video, in which I mainly used Beowulf as an example. For instance, the story is set in a mythologized distant past. The hero has high social rank and superhuman strength and bravery. The characters transverse vast settings, traveling through land, sea, etc., the style of writing is formal and exaggerated. The narrator is omnipresent and knows what is going on both on earth and in the realm of the gods. And the hero's deeds have national or cultural significance. We see this from the very beginning of the epic, where Gilgamesh's people are crying out to the gods to make their king a better leader. Epics can also reveal the moral codes of their culture. As you read the epic, think about what the plot of this fantastical tale is telling us about the morals of the Sumerian and Akkadian cultures. For instance, who is the other, the monster or adversary that the hero faces? This other represents those who break the cultural rules, or could represent someone from a different culture altogether. Think about issues related to sex and gender. For instance, who gets to have romantic ties to whom? How are rules related to romance different for men and women? What are the roles in this society for men and women? Does social rank play into any of these rules? How is violence depicted? Under what circumstances is it justified? What about wealth? How do the characters treat property within their culture and with the other? How do characters communicate with the gods? Do they dream, and do these dreams have significance? And finally, think about how food and alcohol are used in religion or by different social groups. 
In terms of literary elements, look for a classic feature of epics. This is the very first one, after all. The epithet. An epithet is a short description for a character used in place of a name. We'll see epithets used in other epics this semester, like the Odyssey and Beowulf. But in Gilgamesh, for example, Enkidu is referred to as an epithet, the one born on the steppe, in Tablet 4, line 24, as well as other epithets in other locations. If you're wondering, this picture is of a steppe. So that's the kind of landscape where Enkidu was born. Another feature of Gilgamesh is repetition. Look for places where the same scene plays out several times in much the same way. Why does the author do this? The character Enkidu, a kind of wild man in the epic, is acting as a foil to Gilgamesh, meaning his narrative purpose, at least in part, is to create a contrast with the protagonist. This contrast makes the protagonist's, the main character's, qualities and characteristics stand out more prominently. A word about how Gilgamesh is organized. Because it was written in cuneiform, which is done on clay tablets, it is divided into tablets that have line numbers. The line numbering starts over again once you get to a new tablet. Read the directions in the discussion post explanation carefully so that you can cite quotes in the right way. Finally, if you're familiar with the Hebrew or Christian Bible, you'll likely note some similarities right away when you read the episode of Utnapishtim in Tablet 10. I've assigned the pertinent passages from Genesis as a companion reading this week as well. Pay attention to the similarities and differences because they're important ones. For instance, why in each account is only one family saved from the destructive flood? Why do the Sumerian Akkadian gods punish the earth, and how do their reasons differ from those of God in the Bible? Remember, we're reading sacred texts as literature in this course, so we're not looking so much for theological truths or life application, but what the text is telling us about the culture that produced it. That's all the background material to help you with this very old piece of literature. I look forward to reading your discussion posts soon. If you're confused or want to ask a question, please feel free to send me an email or, better yet, drop by my virtual office hours. See you soon.